Hey y'all, this is Sandy Peterson as before, and this time we're going to talk more about Great Obscure Horror. This is third in the season, in the series. Now, you guys are probably already fairly uh, well-versed in obscure horror. After all, you looked me up, right? But I'm still hoping that in these listings of obscure horror things that are not so well-known today, there'll be some things you won't know about. And we'll start with one right here, which is... Thriller. Now, Thriller was a TV show made in the United States in the early 60s. There's also a British series called Thriller about 10 years later. Um, the British thriller is pretty good too, but I, I want to talk about the US one, which is hosted by Boris Karloff, which you know is great. Now, the original thriller is full of some really tense moments. It only lasted two seasons, but in those days, a season was more than 30 shows, so there's lots of episodes. The first season was actually real thrillers, mostly. It didn't have supernatural elements as often. It was still good. There was murder, suspense, and madness. But the second season really shone with uh, uh, supernatural elements. <clears throat> one of my favorites from the first season, for example, an example of a good non-supernatural one, there's a mad bomber. And uh, the bomber is sees the cops after him. He's, he's in an office building planning to bomb them. And uh, it's just hit five o'clock and all the office workers are, are streaming out of the, uh, uh, the elevators to leave. So he slips his bomb into the purse of one of the women office workers. And then the cops catch him and he tells what he did. And they're like, they have to figure out somewhere in the city, there's a woman with a purse with a bomb in it. And they have to go looking for that woman. They have no way of knowing who she is. They're trying to find out the office workers. It's like, what if she's not by the phone? And uh, it's pretty tense. It's uh, I really liked it. Um, but all the shows, all the, these shows I liked, I can't think of a real weak one in it. Uh, one of the things that is really cool about these uh, old anthology TV shows is that the guest stars were often people who later on became pretty well known as uh, as actors for example William Shatner is in a couple of these uh, people like that so you can kind of have fun picking out guys that you remember from from when they were famous before they were famous but still have the same acting talent now one of the things from this one of the reasons I originally looked it up is because as a kid I was watching this show and there was this creepy old haunted house in the bayou and there was pigeons at it for some reason and there was undead and curses and even a reference to what might be Yig. And of course, this is their one of their most famous uh, things Thriller ever did, which is Pigeons from Hell, which is based on a story by Robert E. Howard, a horror story, not like a Conan S story. So I saw Pigeons from Hell, couldn't figure out where it was. I knew it wasn't Twilight Zone. I didn't know, you know, it was in black and white. And it was like 30 years later, I finally found out where Pigeons from Hell came from. And it came from Thriller. So I got all the thrillers basically to watch Pigeons from Hell and found out that all 60 of them are great little shows. Uh, I mean, some are better than others, but the worst thriller is, is really solid and delivers. So I recommend this. I think it's on uh, various web streaming services now. Plus, you can buy the the box set and then have it forever, even if the web streamer destroy your stuff. Okay, my next horror element is From the Inside by Alice Cooper. So everyone knows Welcome to My Nightmare. It's like, it's of course a horror-based album by Alice Cooper. But From the Inside is interesting because what happened here is that Alice Cooper basically checked himself into an asylum for alcoholism, alcoholism and abuse, and it probably saved his life. Now, supposedly, and I've seen no reason to doubt him, everyone in From the Inside, all the songs are about someone that... Alice met there. They're all real. Um, a fun fact is that Rolling Stone attacked from the inside saying, it's too talented and precise. I mean, the rock establishment is so lame, it's beyond parody. One of the songs is about him, you know, and how his his life was spiraling out of control. There's there's people that have fully ado, that get, share the same crazy. There's a guy uh, trying to get out because he can get to his dog because his dog is in the in the pound. And I actually met a crazy guy like this in Berkeley in the uh, 80s who was clearly insane and 
super focused on trying to save his dog. So I guess he cared about someone outside himself, which is good, but he wasn't able to really care for the dog because, you know, he was Looney Tunes. But uh, Berkeley had a lot of Looney Tunes guys back in the back in the 80s. Anyway, from the inside, a whole bunch of insane people that are quite interesting. I, I like the Pentecost preacher who's crazed with lust. There's all kinds of things going on there. And if you haven't heard it and you only all you know is Welcome to My Nightmare or something or like that, um, check out uh, From the Inside. Amphigori, which is a series of picture books by a man named Edward Gorey. There's several of these. So Amphigori is an interesting art style. It, they, they, I mean, it looks like a children's book, but the topics are pretty pretty grim they're all like weird he has a whole bunch of galleries of infernal devices which are things like tea cozies and egg cups presumably wired to blow or something else is wrong with them he has uh, he has these little picture stories about uh, how the insect god gets a kid sacrificed to him um he has alphabets like a kid's book you know uh the a is for ashley consumed by a fire that kind of thing and showing all these kids dying uh, let me give you you one tiny example of Edward Gorey's Amazing Horror with these two images. This is a sequence in one of his tales. You can see it's it's crazy, right? There's multiple volumes. It's still in print. If you want to have a, a, a book that will curl the hair of your sweet old mother-in-law, uh, this is the one. There is a Thai movie called coming soon and that's number 24 on our list you have to look for the Thai movie it's 2008 that might help you find it because typing in coming soon movie like won't really help because you'll get you know coming soon so coming soon is all about video piracy and uh and previews and uh, movies and it, most of it takes place in a, in a big uh multi-theater mall in Thailand. And uh, essentially there's this upcoming movie that is haunted and it's haunted pretty nastily and there's some terrifying images in it, you know, people uh, in the dark projection room with the film playing with one long noose descending from the ceiling and a writhing body in it. And the writhing body is the ghost, you know. There's uh, one of my favorite scenes from it, and this will give you an idea what the movie's like, is when um, they're looking for a friend of theirs and they're going through the dark theater. And a lot of the scenes are in a dark theater with the movie playing because apparently they have to play through the movie with the, to make sure it works before you do the real thing. So they just have it run into an empty theater. So they're going through the dark theater. They're looking for the friend. They can't find him. And the movie, of course, is, is a, is a, uh, uh, is a movie about a, uh, a terrible murderer. You know, actually a murderess. And they're looking for the friend, and they say, and they, he was just here, let's call him. So they call him, I mean, remember the movie's from the background, and they can hear his cell phone ringing, but they still can't find him. So they're looking for the sound of his cell phone, he says, where are you, where are you? And then they realize that the cell phone ringing sound is coming from the speakers. So they turn towards the screen and they see it, and their friend is there on the screen, dead, with his cell phone blinking because, you know, they just called it. In other words, he fell into the movie. Um, so uh, I really like it. Uh, it's one of my favorite scary movies, and even though it's so recent, and I recommend it to you guys. Number 25, Reggie Nalder. So Reggie Nalder is an unjustly obscure actor. Uh, he is in a lot of, uh, of movies I like. He's got this terrifying look to him. Now, in the, there's some very early movies of him where he doesn't have those burn scars. Um, that was probably fortunate for him that he got them because it got him cast in a lot of suspense and horror movies. He worked with Hitchcock. He worked with Dario Argento. He was in Star Trek. He's also the main character in my dog's favorite movie, Zoltan, Hound of Dracula. Man, my dog loved that movie. I'm watching it with my friends and my dog would, would whine when Zolt, when Zoltan is menacing the puppies and he'd growl when Zoltan's sneaking up on someone and she'd bark when Zoltan Zoltan goes to the attack and she really liked Count of Dracula. It was like, it was, maybe that's kind of stereotypical, but you know, like my dog is all about stereotypes. So anyway, so I did see, I've seen one interview with um, Reggie Nalder and in the interview, he kind of came across as a really terrible person, but that might just be because he doesn't interview well. 
or he didn't know or didn't mean what he said. So I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, but man, he seemed like a jerk. Anyway, we know he's from a Jewish family. We know that he appeared in an Austrian movie in 1938, which is just before Hitler occupied Austria. Somehow he escaped. We don't know. He didn't talk a lot about himself. All the mysteries about him died in 1991 with him. Dungeon Master was a video game from 1987, and it was on the Atari ST, which is how I played it, and there was a, a possibly superior version on the Amiga. Now, Dungeon Master was the first game that taught me that a computer game could be scary. Early in the game, there's these dark halls, I'm walking around through them, and there's a, a grating, so I click on the button, the grating goes grrr, 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 and there's a mummy walking forward. This is the first monster I've seen in Dungeon Master. Oh, look, a mummy. It walks up, and it stands in front of me, I'm looking at it, and suddenly it goes and it screamed at me in the, in the crappy Amiga or Atari ST sound thing, and I was so startled, I dropped my mouse, and then the mon before I could got my act together, it killed me, so I had to reload and go back in. So I guess I didn't have to, but I did. So Dungeon Master showed me that the sound, the visuals, one of the things in Dungeon Master is that, is that the tunnels are pitch black. But if you have a torch, <coughs> they lighten up. So if you, so you're looking for tortures and sources of light, you're casting light spells. <coughs> it, it hands down has the best idea for a magic system of any game I've ever played, which I'll just let you discover for yourself. Um, here's how good it was. Um, now, I worked on computer games from 1988 till 2012, so I am, you know, versed in computer games. And like every other computer game developer, I really hate piracy. I don't care if you say, well, I wouldn't really have bought it anyway. Well, you know, screw you. Or if you say, I steal it to try it, then I'll buy it later if I want to. Well, a lot of guys never do anyway. Piracy is bad. There's no defense, in my opinion. If you don't want to pay for the game, then play something else. Especially nowadays. When the, anyway, I'll get off that hobby horse. So when I was in France, 1980, uh, 1988, I met a guy from a pirate club. And what he did is he and his, his coterie of friends, to stay in the club every month, you had to crack one game. They were all Atari ST games. And I guess some of them might have been Amiga. And you'd hand them out to your buddies. By the way, that's what killed the Atari ST, of course, piracy. Anyway, so every month you'd get like 20 or 30 games because all the other guys in your group would crack a game for you. Well, Dungeon Master came out <coughs> and it was, it had some kind of defensive coding that made it really hard to crack. So all the pirates, except for the president of the club, went ahead and bought it so they could play it because it was amazing. Um, the president viewed it as his honor, which I ever obviously review as the reverse of honor, to not ever buy a game. So he spent six weeks working 10 or more hours a week to crack it. And he did, he cracked Dungeon Master. But I'm not sure that 60 hours of effort is worth, you know, the, the $30 game. So anyway, the heck with that guy. Um, I would have words with him today if I saw him, but Dungeon Master, it's available on uh, uh, various legacy sites. Um, so, you know, it's old. It's hard to recommend games for horror. I did. I know I recommended Sanitary in an earlier thing because the controls are clunky now and the graphics don't look as good. But sometimes it's nice to go and kind of see where where things came from. And uh, Dungeon Master's feeling of, of, of doom as you're, as you're sneaking through and the lights are going out and you're starting to starve and you're thirsty and there could be a monster around the corner, you don't know where they are. Um, anyway, there it is. Friday the 13th, the series. This is a TV show from 1987, 1990. I know what you're thinking. Friday the 13th isn't that scary, Sandy. No, it's not. I'm not a fan of Jason and the Friday the 13th series, like, at all. I mean, I'll, I'll watch cheap, crappy slashers, but that one doesn't do much for me. But Friday the 13th, the series, is not about Jason at all. The only reference to him is in some of the opening scrolls, <coughs> there's the hockey mask in one of the images. That's it. They never talk about it. It's like, he's just not there. So what's going on in Friday the 13th, um, which just uses the name Friday the 13th, is that these two cousins who hadn't met each other before now <coughs> joined together because their uncle died and left them his, uh, 
his antique shop. Well, they go there and they and they they sell off the antiques, and uh, and the uncle sold most of them already. And then they discover that the uncle had made a deal with the devil, and he was selling cursed antiques. And the and so the characters in the show they have to go and get these cursed antiques back, get them out of the hands of the public because because they're terrible. They do awful things. They kill people and worse. So uh, one of the things making it hard for them is that one of the features, in fact, one of the ways they can identify if it's a real cursed item or not is that the cursed items are indestructible. You know, like a little doll, you can't destroy it. Incidentally, I will say don't give up after the first episode. It has a creepy killer doll, but it's kind of hackneyed. It's like the worst episode of the whole series. So don't give up. Um, they, 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 uh, they, they are strong from then on. They're trying to get these cursed items and they lock them up in a vault underground. Sometimes weird things happen. Like one episode, a, uh, a family of demon hunters decides that the cousins are bad guys because they have a vault full of cursed magic items and they go after them and they have to convince them that, no, no, we're not bad. And they said, well, don't you have all these cursed items? Well, yes, but we're kind of keeping away from people. It says, don't you have a well to hell in your basement? It says, well, yes, but that was from our, you know, it's, it's, uh, like, they're kind of busted, right? Anyway, it's got uh, some wonderful things. One of my favorite uh, stories from it is about a cursed, get this, a wood chipper, okay? And what and what the deal is with the wood chipper is, if you feed a person, the, the guy that owns it just uses a wood chipper, but his his crappy uh, assistant finds out that if you feed a, he, he feeds a homeless guy to it. To get to, because he has to cover up something and the whole and then money comes blowing out of the other end not very much you know 20 30 bucks so later on he feeds someone else into it and this is like a more substantial citizen and there's more money so when you feed a person into the wood chipper money comes out but the money is based on that person's value so he's like i gotta upscale i gotta find like doctors and lawyers politicians so he's trying to feed ever more important people in his wood chipper so the money comes flying out and that's just an example of one of the magic items i mean there's uh, there's uh, three seasons of it with like 30 episodes a season and every season has a, every story has a different magic item and it's uh, it's pretty great uh, there's demons that show up and other things so Friday the 13th the series much better than you might suspect from the title number 28 this is a short Irish film called The Thing at 237 you'll notice I'm not showing any images it's directed by Ray Sullivan. It's on his art station channel. It's on Amazon Prime. It's on YouTube. It's only eight minutes long, so I'm not going to spend time describing it or even show you a picture. Watch it if you're curious. It's eight minutes or don't. I will say it impressed two hardened teenagers. My next thing is for someone you may have heard of, but I, these guys this are all the publicity they get. This is Darkest of the Hillside Thickets, a rock band. If you are a Lovecraft fan at all, these guys rule. Some of my personal favorites are Going Down to Dunwich, Please God, No, that's the name of a song, Unstoppable, man, Shoggoth's Away. I love everything they do. Watch this sequence for the next 30 seconds. The audio's absolutely terrible, but you can see the actual band singing a song about Nerlathotep with lyrics in ancient Egyptian. That should score them some pretty major points. I'll wait here. to the hillside thickets which by the way comes from a lovecraft story good luck finding the phrase they have criminally few albums but the good news is that this means you can get all their albums pretty easily there's only three or four so what are you waiting for wouldn't you like to sing along to my god is green the last one I have for you today is Mad Love. Now, there's lots of films named Mad Love today, mostly comedies, but this is the old black and white movie from 1935, and it's the real deal. It's actually Mad Love. It's a Peter Lorre showpiece. 
He plays Dr. Gogol, who's in love with an act nurse who plays in the Grand Guignol, which I might be mispronouncing, but the Grand Guignol was the type of theater they used to have in, in Paris. It was the name of the theater. And you'd go there and they would do like really horrific things. Like they would have a, a torture chamber or, or, or beheading or a monster on the loose killing people or something bloody. And they had all these special effects to make blood. And now, Grand, the, sadly, the original Grand Guignol is closed down, but Grand Guignol is a general phrase for any kind of bloody, extravagant thing. So he likes to go see it because he sees this lady mostly being tortured to death and stuff in the Grand Guignol. And he's super creepy. Uh, when the lady decides to retire, like the, the company decides, well, let's get rid of her wax statue we have, or he buys the wax statue to keep it home. I mean, when the prison's going to have an execution, they know to call Dr. Gogol. Oh, Dr. Gogol, they're going to be a guillotine. So he runs down to watch it. But on the other hand, this creepy Dr. Gogol is a good doctor. He works well with kids. He, you see him doing things to actually save lives and change things for the better. But, you know, he's also the guy that has a wax image of the girl he's obsessed with in his house. As you'd imagine, that wax figure has a role to play in the finale. Laurie's Dr. Gogol isn't just a villain. He's an obsessed person. This obsession does lead to horror and crimes and murder, but that's kind of the point. Gogol didn't have to be villainous, but the madness is what's underneath this. And that's how it turns out. It also features Colin Clive, who played Dr. Frankenstein, as the husband of the woman. I mean, she's married and goggles after, right? He's okay, but Peter Lorre owns the set every time he shows up. <clears throat> it is romantic because it's genuinely about love. It's genuinely about madness. And frankly, most things called mad love aren't genuine about either of those. <clears throat> so... Because you guys have stuck with me through 30 of these obscure great horrors, you're going to get a bonus. Uh, no, not something free, but it's a, uh, this is, this, this is Oldest and Fatherless, The Terrible Secret of Tom Bombadil. So this maybe is only scary to lovers of Tom Bombadil, um, or sorry, lovers of Tolkien. Uh, but there is a surprisingly robust theory that Tom Bombadil is a thing of evil. I recommend Googling the title we give here, The Terrible Secret of Tom Bombadil. Go see the live journal blog from KM515, who presents a terrific case that I find compelling. Sadly, KM515 doesn't post very often, or at least not under that name. I'd love to see more of his or her stuff. The basics are that Tom has to be a big liar because no one has ever heard of him. He says, for example, oh, like they, he lives right next to the Shire. The hobbits haven't heard of Tom Bombadil, this guy who wanders around gambling and singing. How can they hear us? He tells the hobbits, Maggot told me you were coming, but Maggot didn't know the hobbits were leaving the Shire. How could he have told Tom? Okay, and then he says, oh, I heard about this from Gildor's elves. Well, Elrond, it's clear, has never heard of Tom Bombadil. If Gildor had heard of Bombadil, Elrond would too. So one of the things about Middle-earth is that Middle-earth, when a place is bad, like Moria or the, you know, the Dark Forest or, or Mordor, it looks creepy. What you are affects the world around. It's kind of like the Fisher King theory, right? So what's the most dangerous place in Middle-earth? Moria, where bad things happen. What's the second most dangerous place in Middle-earth? Well, Bombadil's country. It's full of black Hurons and undead. Every tree hates the hobbits. Look, by comparison, Mordor is pretty safe. The hobbits travel for days through Mordor without being endangered. Also, why is Bombadil tied to his small area? Well, isn't that more the sign of a cursed land than a benign one? I mean, I know that um, Galadriel seems kind of tied to her area, but she's not really. She could leave. Anyway, the blogger, KM515, goes on to speculate about Goldberry and Tom Bombadil's purpose. But hey, you can read it for yourself. This, by the way also explains why Tom Bombadil's songs are the most annoying and difficult to get through part of the trilogy. See? It all makes sense. J.R.R., what were you thinking?